Is there anything that we can learn from the the stool sample testing? Does that allow us to at least identify whether we have a, a good amount of diversity or yeah. does it does it provide any insights into perhaps specific bacteria that we need or specific bacteria where we have too much? Your colon is the highest density of microbes in your body. So most of your quote unquote microbiome is going to be in your colon. So in that regard, if you want to really understand what is in my gut microbiome on a kind of holistic level, yeah, a stool sample is going to be a pretty good surrogate for what you have. And it'll, based on what's in that stool sample and in your colonic microbiome, that can give you an indication of if you might have something else going on higher up. So if you have reduced diversity in your colon, you probably have reduced diversity in your small intestine too. The two don't necessarily, while they're separate and you have different things going on there, you know, there's it goes down one direction, right? And so you have small intestinal bugs will flow through and there, there is mixing that goes on. So you will get some indication of what's happening in, in the gut in a broader picture through a stool sample. Are we at the stage where you can do a kind of microbiome stool test, send it into a company and get accurate information back that can tell you very specifically you should eat more of this, you should eat less of this, maybe you should supplement with this probiotic, this prebiotic, this postbiotic? That's a loaded question. <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> question. The answer, my first, my first thought is no, but that's not entirely true. The challenge is that, um, is with the nutritional advice, not so much with the probiotic recommendations. And so I'll explain that a little bit better. Um, what is, if you took your a stool sample and in your colon microbiome, you should see, you should expect to see, like if I were looking at it, certain thing, I would, there's certain things I'd be looking for, right? That would be an indicator. Okay. You're appropriate. Like you have good diversity and I'd look for that. Okay. What else would you look for? I, I, that's primarily what I'd be looking for. And I'd be looking for the absence of potential pathogens, okay. right? And if I saw a clear gap in there, a whole, a, a really important like adult species was missing or a whole genus was gone, I would say, okay, maybe that's a, a sequencing artifact. Maybe we need to do it again. And if you see it again, I'd say, okay, there's something you, that's an important group of organisms. If it is missing, then a probiotic is useful, okay, to, re, to repopulate that. Um, but if, if you have diversity, a probiotic won't do anything. It won't colonize because most of your probiotics are already in that community. And so, like I said, the neighborhood with the house is filled, your house is already filled. And so it's a much better approach to use nutrition to fill, to promote numerically more of them. Taking a probiotic doesn't help. Right. Which is where prebiotics come yes. in and maybe maybe we should another thing that we should define here at the top yeah so prebiotics versus probiotics versus postbiotics yeah prebiotics are the f historically refer to fibers different fiber types that can promote beneficial gut bacteria that make short chain fatty acids specifically butyrate acetate and propionate um, because those are are very well studied and shown to maintain your gut barrier um, but people have extended that definition now beyond fibers and really being any dietary component you eat that can beneficially influence your gut microbiome. So prebiotic is things that you eat that are not more organisms or food. Probiotics are taking live, live organisms in hopes that they colonize your right. gut. And then a postbiotic is, is a bit contentious, but the, um, in the microbiome field, Generally, we accept that a postbiotic is all the chemical byproducts that a microbe makes. So you're taking all that good gamish that they're pumping out into the system and you're just consuming that directly. Right. So a short-chain fatty acids, would they be considered a postbiotic? Yeah, they would be. Among other things. Exactly, yeah. Gotcha. But the challenge with, with that concept is that you can't just consume them uh, because they don't all go to the right place if you just take them freely. So they right, have. If you to were be, just to consume butyrate, yeah, it won't it won't get to your colon, which is where you want it to be. So all these butyrate right. pills that people right. are pushing, they have to be conjugated yeah. to something. So that's an example. We outsourced that to yeah. the bacteria that are local to the gut lining. Yeah, exactly. So in that, that's where you want that to be produced. So which is why I tend to say 
prebiotics are better because you feed the bugs in their native location to, to produce that. And so on back to your the point you were making about probiotics there was that if you tested someone and they had good diversity, a single probiotic wouldn't colonize. Yeah. Or probably wouldn't. Probably wouldn't. Does that mean that they wouldn't benefit from a probiotic if, if they have good baseline diversity? Essentially, yeah. If you have good baseline diversity, there's no need to take a probiotic. You just want to maintain what you have, support it, and do that through diet. I think that's interesting. I think a lot of people think that gut health is reliant upon taking probiotics every day. Yeah. Well, people assume their gut microbiome is messed up for some reason, you know, unless they have reason. Like most people are, well, probably in two camps, the supplement forward folks who want to optimize. And then the folks who have bloating, gas, digestive issues where they have some indication that something's not working properly and they want a solution. So there's the two groups. For the group that needs a solution, I understand why a probiotic seems logical. For the otherwise healthy individual with normal digestion, a probiotic is, in my opinion, a waste of money. And if you're in the group that has the bloating, the digestive discomfort, the gas, and so you're thinking, well, my my microbiome seems to be a bit off. If you are not doing microbiome testing, how would you know what species could potentially colonize and be beneficial? That, that's the problem. Most people don't do that. So without the testing, you don't know which probiotic maybe you should take or what you might be missing. In the case of bloating or gas, it tends to actually be you have too much of a microbe that is Produce, you know, eating certain fibers and is just overproducing gas. Um, and so you may actually want an approach that suppresses those. It's not necessarily taking a probiotic that's going to fix the problem. Right. Is that is that where something like a low FODMAP diet comes in? Yeah, things like that, exactly. Yeah. Okay. On the testing, and we don't have commercial ties or I don't have commercial ties, I'm just asking this purely because I know there are so many options out there. And as a microbiome scientist, I have to imagine there are different ways of analyzing stool. Yeah. So from a clinical research point of view, like what would the most accurate, valid way of, of looking at stool be so that if someone's listening and they want to do this, they're going to be more likely to find that gap? Yeah. So I don't have any commercial ties to any companies either. Um, but I did do a study on this and went through the commercially available kits um, and looked at what what method do they use to analyze the microbiome. And it's all different. Every company takes a different approach for the most part, which is challenging if you decide to use one company and then another. If you send your same sample to two companies, you'll get different results because the methods are different and different methods will give you different results. So I think that's important to appreciate is that there's no one like the, the res output you get depending on your kit isn't the end all and be all for your microbiome. So it's... <laughs> It, it's challenging. So there's a targeted approach where you can say, okay, I want to know, do I have these beneficial microbes and do I have these pathogens? A targeted approach, in my opinion, is best. And that's a quantitative PCR-based approach, which because it's it's high fidelity tagging, you can get quantitative results. And it's really, you, you can really trust that data because it amplifies it out of the whole gamish. But most people are not in that group. Most people want to know tell me who, what my microbiome is. And so you have to take a much more agnostic approach. You might only do a targeted approach after you already know what your agnostic microbiome looks like. So the agnostic approaches are all relative abundance based. They're not quantitative. So it's all how much of this do I have, you know, out of a hundred percent, what do I have? And so getting back to the acromancia question, that's where if it's really low, anything that there's a limited de detection there. So you may have organisms but they won't be they won't be um, detected by those methods. The other important thing to note is that um, a lot of the early tests and some current tests use what's called the 16S RNA sequencing. That does not give you species level um, identities. It'll only tell you kind of the genus level. Do I have bifidobacterium and and things like that? Um, more and more companies are using what's called metagenomic sequencing, which can get you to the 
species level, it tends to be more expensive. And then there are companies like Viome, which is kind of everywhere, um, where they take a di very different approach and they use metatranscriptomics. And that actually looks at bacterial functions. That's a very exciting sort of more sophisticated sequencing approach. However, the sample handling that's required to do that reliably is much more challenging. So I do question how a mailed-in sample, how the integrity of that sample is, is, is appropriate for that approach. So no, no one of them is perfect, but what I tend to tell people is one is not enough. You have to do multiples because on any given day, your microbiome is going to change, right? So you want multiple data points to understand your baseline. And the second is if you pick a company, stick with that company. Don't send it somewhere else because you're just going to confuse yourself. Right. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1,000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.